Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the roundtable titled Sark is Dead, Long Live Sark, Reviving South Asian Regionalism, organized by Beeps in collaboration with Taka Tribune. The moderators for today are Beeps President, Major General A.N.M. Munir Zaman and Mr. Zafar Sobhan, editor of Dhaka Tribune. The panelists consist of Mohammad Tohid Hassan, Ms. Aisha Kabir, and Dr. Marufa Akhtar. I would like to request the moderators to carry on with the rest of the session. Thank you. Thank you. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum and a very good morning to all of you. Some of you may be suffering lack of sleep from yesterday's game, but nevertheless, we want to start slightly on time. The title of today's deliberation is absolutely apt because South Asia as a region is perhaps one of the least integrated. It is one of the most populous regions of the world with some major powers habiting this space, including two major nuclear powers, a region with a history of conflict. Yet the region has been least integrated and lacks all forms of cooperation as of today. The very concept, the embryonic ideas of South Asian regionalism and cooperation first was articulated indirectly in some manner by Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman while he was addressing a rally in Kolkata. But the very concept of SARC was mooted by Bangladesh by President Zia Rahman. So Bangladesh can take the proud privilege of a country that gave the concept of SARC. Yet today, after many years, we find that SARC is no longer functioning. Some say that it is dead, some say it's in coma, but the fact remains that it is not functioning. We have all the functionaries of SARC in place. We have a excellent functioning secretariat in Nepal, in Kathmandu. Yet the potential of SARC has not been realized as the founding fathers had the vision of SARC. The reason being that SARC is a victim of the hyphenated relationship between India and Pakistan. The biggest member of the organization has never taken a positive view of this organization and therefore SARC has not been able to function. One of the reasons that ASEAN does function is because the largest member of that organization was magnanimous enough and realistic enough to accept the reality of the ground and level the asymmetry that exists in that region. But in South Asia, the largest member has never accepted the asymmetric positioning of members of the region. So therefore, it has never taken off and whenever it took off, it limped again. Yet when I was going through some of the achievements of the organization, I see that SARC has really achieved a lot. As a matter of fact, SARC in many ways was ahead of its time in identifying some of the key areas of cooperation. For example, the SARC Regional Convention on Suppression of Terrorism was enacted as early as 1987, way before the UN enacted the UN Conventions on Counterterrorism. SARC had its Convention on Cooperation of Environment in April 2010, way before environment and climate change was top of the agenda and the global agenda. So SARC did see the potential for regional cooperation as it manifests in some of the key areas of cooperation. Yet today, we have a regional body comprising initially of seven members and with the addition of Afghanistan, now the membership has gone up to eight and we have nine observer countries, including Australia, China, European Union, 
Iran, Japan, Mauritius, Myanmar, South Korea, and United States. So eight member states and nine observer countries. It also has five specialized bodies and they are in existence and they function. It also has a number of regional centers spread across the region which functions very effectively in certain key areas of their functionaries. But the fact remains that the main engine of SARC, which is the SARC summit, or the meeting of the heads of governments and states, has not taken place after 80, the last convention, last summit that was held in Kathmandu in 2014. The 2016 summit, or the 19th summit of SARC, which was to be held in Islamabad, was cancelled because of the unwillingness of some key member countries to attend that summit. And since then, it has never taken off. So it is our intention today to find out what has gone wrong and what we are missing out and what should be done. The lack of a regional platform or regional cooperation body in South Asia has also delegated South Asia to a status that it becomes somewhat irrelevant in the international system. Whereas regional bodies like ASEAN has taken a precedence in most of the international form, forums and most of the international platforms as a representative of a large part of Asia. Yet South Asia, which is the most populous part of this region, has become quite irrelevant. But the fact remains, as Aisha Kabir will let her explain to you, there is no substitute for SARC. It is the only all Asian, all South Asian or pan-South Asian regional body that we have got and it is imperative that we make it function. With that introduction, I will now go back to our various team panelists to give their comments and remarks before we open the floor for an mm -hmm. open discussion. I would also like to mention that we have the privilege of having Dr. Iftikhar Ahmed Chaudhary, the former advisor of foreign affairs in the government of Bangladesh, who was involved in the initial work of the formation of SARC as a diplomat in the foreign office. So we'll also hear from him as we open the floor. But well, first of all, I would like to go back to Mr. Tawhid Hussain, the former foreign secretary, to give his comments. Tohid, you have the floor for 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I, I think I'll start with a quote from Mr. Muchkun Dube, uh, the former High Commissioner of India to Bangladesh, and of course, then also, he also a renowned scholar. Uh, he had visited Dhaka some years back, and then the journalist said, Okay. And the journalist had asked him, do you think Sark is dead? He said, well, uh, it seems Sark is dead, but don't yet bury it. It might resuscitate someday. So um, we have remained hopeful that it will uh, come up again. But uh, as of today, we do not see any indication. In fact, nobody speaks of Sark. After a long time, uh, General Munir has brought up this issue in, in a forum, but <laughs> In the last few years, I haven't seen anyone speaking of SARC at all. We have this satellite is functioning. As you said, that is functioning quite well. Uh, there are some programs, but uh, 38 years since the foundation and what we have in our hand to show to the people of this region, virtually nothing. Uh, the trade goes as usual, mostly on bilateral terms, although there is some uh, FTA sort of thing. Um, the major exports of many countries have not been covered by that. And then um, the uh, free movement of people, nothing has happened. In fact, the uh, size of the, uh, of the visa forms have grown during this time instead of becoming smaller. Um, we have 
some institutions, for example, the Self Development Fund. It had, uh, it was uh, uh, founded in 2005, and then, um, you know, in the uh, Sri Lanka summit, uh, the headquarters was uh, uh, agreed to be set up in uh, in Bhutan. I think that was fine, uh, uh, although initially Bangladesh wanted to have the headquarters in Dhaka, uh, but it has a total fund commitment of $43 million, peanuts, by any standard. And well, uh, for Bhutan, maybe it's some money, but then uh, the smallest economy of this region. But for others, uh, the high sounding uh, probabilities and possibilities and then $43 million in total fund commitment doesn't make much of a, a difference. Um, I think the pivotal position of India is important in uh, having anything to do with regionalism uh, in this in this country, uh, uh, in this region. Actually, this region is unique in a way that uh, all the countries have, except Afghanistan, which basically is a Central Asian country, um, all the countries have borrowed with, China, uh, with India. None of them have borrowed with each other. This is not the case in any other country in any grouping in the world. Uh, this is also, uh, I would say, very, very unique. Uh, and that makes uh, a situation in which it's only India which can take it forward. And unless, uh, and as uh, General Moniz has already indicated, then in India has not done much to uh, take this organization forward. So uh, that way, I think it is reflected that uh, because India is not doing much, or for example, the last summit was uh, stopped at Indian behest, and uh, and that is the reality. So unless India comes up strongly in favor of regionalism, I don't think any regionalism is going to work or that, well, uh, long live SARC is fine. We have a secretariat which is functioning and we have uh, some programs, some uh, initiatives, but otherwise it will remain where it is unless India comes up. Uh, if we speak of um, regionalism, there are certain other initiatives also that have taken place in this region. For example, uh, the SAGQ came up as a uh, South Asian Growth Quadrennial, as came up as a sub-regional initiative of SARC. Um, look at it, what are the progress? Uh, basically, almost nothing. Uh, one good initiative was the BBI and Motor Vehicles Agreement. Even that uh, is quite... Uh, seven years already gone, but uh, we still don't see cars uh, or uh, trucks moving from one country to the other, except to India. Um, in fact, the Nepalese trucks which carry goods for Bangladesh can come up to the border but cannot enter Bangladesh because they do not have the permit to cross the Indian border into Bangladesh. So there is transshipment, Indian trucks can come into Bangladesh. So, so again comes up the question of India. Um, Bimstek could have been an alternate because Bimstek, um, slightly differing, differing in opinion from uh, General Munir is that um, Bimstek could be a really a, a regional cooperation area, connecting some countries of SARC and some countries of uh, ASEAN. But again, we have the uh, you know the situation in Myanmar the Rohingya issue and uh, everything is, is, you know, again, bogged down as far as uh, this is uh, this sub-regional or regional cooperation is concerned. We have the economic corridor called uh, BCIM. Uh, there is no, virtually no communication uh, that way because uh, nothing is happening uh, from China to Bangladesh and India via Myanmar. So, uh, overall, if we look at it, what do we see? We see that all the initiatives, uh, SARC included, all the initiatives have somehow been bogged down and unless India comes up in a big way, nothing is going to happen. I would, um, I would prefer that India at least gives a chance to the sub-regional corporations coming up, if not, uh, if not at SARC. SARC, because uh, of the uh, relation of animosity between uh, Pakistan and India, which 
I don't think in our lifetime or in the lifetime of many of the younger people present here is going to be resolved because uh, the india pakistan conflict has uh, certain certain you know aspects which you don't see going to resolve soon uh, what can be a possible uh, uh, talk between india and pakistan is only conversion of the line of control into a, a greek border that can lead to peace is that going to happen i do not foresee i do not foresee because of political reasons not because of practical reasons practically that would have been the ideal solution but no pakistani government can survive after saying that we accept this border uh, this uh, loc as a border and equally no indian government i believe will survive uh, such a uh, such a uh, commitment although both the governments both the countries know it very well that they can never occupy the others uh, area controlled by others there can be minor adjustments after some skirmishes or that's a different thing but then uh, the target of uh, say from indian side of occupying the uh, pakistan administered kashmir is not going to happen because particularly because even if uh, it is militarily possible for uh, in a in an india pakistan conflict which is also not possible in my opinion china is involved so china cannot allow india to occupy that part of kashmir likewise pakistan doesn't have the means to occupy the indian administered kashmir and uh, go about it so this is something that will never happen and so pakistan and india will not become friends uh, or uh, will not uh, see eye to eye on regional cooperation and all we should remember that initially uh, there was uh, resistance from both pakistan and india i am sure uh, dr sagar mitchodri uh, will vouch for me because india thought that is ganging up of the other countries against india and pakistan thought that it is going to be a uh, you know some sort of indian hegemonistic ambition but of course uh, i would again say that uh, i would again agree that it was bangladesh initiative and uh, and bangladesh diplomacy that made possible the uh, founding of sark at all uh, i don't uh, see how bangladesh can again take an initiative to actually bring up sark on the surface and allow it to uh, start functioning uh, but i think uh, the initiative will have to come from countries other than pakistan and india uh, pakistan and india to um, make sark functional again will it uh, be possible in near future i am not very optimistic but of course as muskun dubey said that we should not bury sark and hope that some day it will again resuscitate I'll stop there. Thank you. I hope I have not crossed my time limit. Larry, thank you very much for your comments and remarks. <coughs> very rightly so that if you echo the sentiment of the person you're quoting, which could do make, we firmly feel that we should still try and revive the concept of SARC. And in this, I think Bangladesh should again be the lead in trying to make it work because the concept was mooted by Bangladesh. and we owe our responsibility and commitment to the concept that we should make it work again and with those remarks from tohid aishing i will now go to aisha kabir the head of protomalo english aisha you have the floor thank you general munir and good morning and assalam alaikum ladies and gentlemen so uh, there was a time when sar was a buzzword in this region in bangladesh for sure and in the region it was something that was uh, taken very positively and i'm not talking about like at the government level even right down to the people there was something so positive about sar that that it really became a buzzword but the present state of sar is extremely unfortunate because it's been reduced to virtually nothing it still exists in name but hardly in effect so today when we discuss about the forum 
there's one question that looms large. Why Sark? But I think already our two previous speakers, General Munir and uh, Tawhid Hussain, from what they've said, I think the answer to why Sark is why not? Because if we look at the basic uh, objectives of Sark, why was Sark formed? Very basically because it aimed at an integration of the South Asian nations to get to undertake some collective efforts to achieve common objectives of regional stability and prosperity. So let me just briefly, very briefly, say what were the objectives of SARC? One was like to promote the welfare of the people of South Asia, improve their quality of lives, to uh, accelerate economic growth, social progress, cultural development in the region by providing all individuals the opportunity to live in dignity and to realize that to their full potential. To promote and strengthen collective self-reliance among the countries of South Asia, contribute to mutual trust, understanding, appreciation of one another's problems, very important, and to promote active collaboration, mutual assistance in economic, social, cultural, technical and scientific fields, strengthen cooperation with other developing countries, strengthen cooperation uh, among themselves in international uh, forums on matters of common interest, cooperate with the international and regional organizations with similar aims and purposes. So these are some of the basic objectives of SAR. Which one of these objectives can anyone disagree with? On theory, nobody can disagree with because it's a win-win situation if we look at these objectives. If we decide, dissect this, we'll see each and every objective is beneficial to each and every country of SAR. But the fact remains that SARC now has become dysfunctional. It's not dead, certainly not, but perhaps in a state of suspended animation. Now, we're talking about the revival of SARC, long live SARC. How can it be revived? Sure, it's certainly, we don't have the, you know, any abracadabra or any magic lamp just to rub it and revive SARC, but we can discuss and find out possible ways. I'm speaking here, I'm a journalist, so I'm speaking here not as a diplomat or academic, rather from a people's point of view, as people perceive it, since it is about people of this region. So how to activate SAC all over again? And do we actually want to activate it? That's another question. Or do we want to just relegate it to oblivion? But before we search the answer to the questions, let us briefly touch on SARC, such a vibrant for uh, such a vibrant forum. Let's see that why has it reached this state? Why has it become so dormant? Such a vital, such a vibrant forum. Why has it become dormant? So there's a general understanding is that that there's a very very blunt, bluntly put with. I'm not a diplomat, so let me put it. What the people's perception is is that. What we feel in general is that the tenacious rivalry and tensions, bluntly put, the enmity between India and Pakistan is a major bottleneck to the successful manifestation of SARC. These tensions have led to the cancellations of the regular SARC summit, have rele relegated SARC not just to the back benches, but into cold storage. But that seems a very, very uh, basic, very simplistic answer to why is SARC in this uh, state. Um, there's a very simple explanation, and it's not untrue. If two members of a family are so up in arms against each other, it's hardly possible for the family to be functional as a unit. The family members separate, take sides, and the constructive unity is lost. And that enmity spills over and affects the entire family. And that's what's happened to SARC. Then again, there's a matter of symmetry, a balance. But there's asymmetry in the region, a lack of symmetry in the region due to the sheer size of Indian economy, the stature in the international arena, its clout as a regional power. But, you know, it has a great power, but to quote Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. So does not India play that responsible role in the region? Does it play that 
responsible role or does it act as a regional big brother? So, Sark, is there a sense of reluctance in India to, you know, relinquish that role it has, you know, the alpha male role and uh, be one of the crowd and, you know, be on par with the other seven members? Those are questions that have been asked. So, again, when I ask why Sark, and the answer comes again, why not? Because there are other regional uh, associations which uh, um, Ambassador Tawhid Hussain has already touched on, because we've seen so many around the world, not just so there's the European Union, Asian, BIMSTIC, and more so. And it's so we need that cooperation. We need that to engage in constructive cooperation for the betterment of all concerned, to give strength to the countries of the region and give an international voice to the countries, to give clout, to promote a spirit of friendship, to ensure a win-win situation for all. Let me put it on simple terms. We have huge populations in this region, burgeoning populations, Bangladesh. I mean, how can we be constructively constructively help each other. For example, Bangladesh has a large population. Now, this is a very simplistic way I'm putting it. and But we're very proud because in Bangladesh, we have one of the most successful family planning programs where even conservative villages are going and are very receptive about things which could be sensitive before, like contraceptives, our reproductive health inputs. Then our immunization program for children is exemplary which other South Asian countries don't have. Even the COVID immunization, the vaccine, we had, we were more successful than many countries. And the reason I'm saying this is that this is a way we could act as a role model to others, and even in microfinance. Then if you go to India, uh, they had such a successful um, dairy project, their dairy program. It's a model for the world. Pakistan's textile industry, the footballs which are pl being played in the World Cup, made in Pakistan, though I think now it, China's got a step ahead. But there's so many things we can all share with each other. Nepal, and during times of crisis, there's so much we can exchange, in exchange of technology, exchange of knowledge. There's no end to the cooperation. And even, see, even our failures, we talk about Sri Lanka, the situation it is. We are learning from their mistakes too. Now, one of the most important things I feel why we need SARC or a regional body right now is because, especially after the Ukraine-Russian war, there's a feeling that, you know, which globalization had taken over, was actually globalized, taken over the whole globe. Globalization has become, was suddenly gone on, to, on the wane, especially, it was going on the wane anyway, but with the Russia-Ukraine war, we've seen that some, it's been put into question. Because um, after that, that, particularly the Russian-Ukraine conflict has been, had a domino effect uh, all over the world. It's caused fuel prices to soar prices of other commodities, foreign exchange crisis, economic crisis, food crisis. So globalization is at a loss here. Financial transactions, shipments, communication is the globalized system. And that just was no longer feasible. And we are all bearing the brunt. So this is bringing home the realization and reviving the importance of regionalism. I'm not dismissing globalization, but a strong, constructive regional association would help us effectively deal with the impacts of the global crisis. So what is to be done and what is the way ahead? There's only one way ahead, logically speaking. Working out the details is another matter, but there's only one way ahead, I would think, is to revive SARC. Some may see BIMSTEC, the Bay of Bengal Initiative for Multisexual Technical and Economic Cooperation as an alternative. But over there, there's an absence of Pakistan, and that negates the South Asian unity and also learn, lends further imbalance. So BIMSTEC has its own share of issues like the Rohingya crisis between Myanmar and Bangladesh, the refugee crisis between Bhutan and Nepal. 
So the scopes and objectives of BIMSTEC and STAR are not one and the same. Therefore, BIMSTEC can be seen as complementary to SARC in a regional integration, but not an alternative. And if we look at it objectively, no one is opposed to SARC, actually. It's elements in the certain governments of the region that may be opposed to it. And uh, they've put the brakes on the progress. But the people... The people want unity. They yearn for unity. Look how popular. Again, I want to give a very uh, a simplistic uh, explanation. Look how popular Indian movies are in any of the countries of SARC, even in Pakistan. Look how popular Pakistan singers are in India or the rest of the region. Look at uh, the most popular tourist resorts of Nepal, Sri Lanka, even Bhutan. And I think we in Bangladesh have uh, an epitome of the spark, spark spirit in one person, and that is our singer Runa Laila. I mean, who doesn't love her in the region? So it just shows that the people are one. Yes, we all have our. We are proud of our separate nations, but we are also a. We also have a strong South Asian identity. So let the people decide. Do the people have a choice? They don't really have a choice, actually. But if the elections in our, all of our countries are fair, if there's democracy in a true sense, if the people can have a chance at exerting their will and desire, Sark will rise up again like a phoenix from the ashes. And this region will stand up proud on the global stage. Thank you. Asha, I really appreciate and echo your sentiments of hope. I really hope it comes true someday. It is also important for us to know that South Asia for the first time brought the South Asian identity. The very concept of South Asia and its people identity as South Asians came with the concept of SARC. So SARC is not only a functional body, it's a question of a regional identity, which is also equally important. Both Tohid and Aisha mentioned about BIMSTEC, but I'm of the personally of the opinion that these regional and sub-regional cooperation functionaries are important, but they are not a substitute for SARC. For the reason that there is no single organization in the region that includes all eight South Asian nations. BIMSTEC is a combination of South Asian countries and Southeast Asian countries. So therefore, it is not a right substitute for SARC. Unless we can create or recreate a regional body that includes all eight South Asian nations, SARC is the only platform that we have, and it is important that it functions. So I will now go back to our third speaker. And our third speaker today is... Dr. Marufa Attar, he, she's the head of the Department of Global Studies in IUB. in IUB in the School of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences. So Marufa, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And good morning to everyone. I think being a last speaker is um, the role of the last speaker is sometimes um, the pardon comes to the person's shoulder in terms of time management also. All of them have spoken most of the topic. So let's focus. I would like to, being a student of international relations, I would like to start with the idea why states tend to make regional organization. They have already spoken about it. But the concept of regionalism may vary to context to context, but usually um, is a process in which countries that share geography with close proximity have some common interest, common history, which help them ultimately to achieve a mutually set goals. And ideas and interest of actors here are very much important for the outcome of any organizations. And these policy preferences of the state actually um, originated from their basic interest. I think the previous, all the speakers have emphasis on that, that interest are lacking in most of the cases in 
very much contentious issues. If you look at uh, look at the data, like which is the hostility and friendship data, uh, which is one of the data uh, in Gang Ganga's basin, they have said that this is the most um, conflictual re region in the last 50 years. They have gone through multiple negotiations and conflict. So the good part is they went through negotiations. Maybe this is also a good sign that even if they are going through a long history of disputes, but negotiations may be possible. Maybe I would be very, very optimistic here, but I would like to tend because today we are talking about how to revive. We have spoken a lot about why it is not working, what is the problem. We all know what is the problem. Maybe it's time very much to talk about how we can revive, especially as Aisha uh, ma'am spoke it enough. Like this is a crisis moment. The world is going to face um, multiple crises with the start of conflict. Um, with the con uh, war, Ukraine war. So I would like to talk about the one concept that um, uh, Riedberger Volker, it's a, a German uh, political scientist, talked about how international organization can emerge. I would like to point out this theory, which they identified the three conditions, problem statement, cognitive community, and hegemonic conditions. The three conditions may lead to a problem, lead to a emergence of a uh, organization. So what is the problem statement? Let me uh, uh, emphasize on this, that international organization emerges when complex interdependence interdependencies push states into international corporations to further common interest, which is problem conditions. And if you look into the what is cognitive conditions, that is when they are the mere fact of the existence of the complex interdependencies themselves, but also on the realization that these interdependencies lead to the problem which can only be overcome through cooperation with international organizations. The third condition is when a hegemonic state is willing to bear the cost of the creation of the organizations. Now, Riedberger showed that uh, with the examples of different international organizations, including International United Nations, League of Nations, which is not anymore, but other international organizations, empirically it was proven, right? And now if we look into the SARC, how the states can actually um, revisit their problem conditions, how the cognitive community across the South Asian region can collaborate on these issues. That is most important. So it's very much timely to explore the common interest and mutual point of cooperation. One issue could be water. I know this is a very contentious issue, but it can also be a future for cooperation. Discontinuity in sustainable water supply is one of the major problems in the riparian countries in the region. Lack of steady water supply in the dry season provokes the states to build larger water storage dam to conserve, conserve monsoon water, which ultimately impacted the other countries. The second example is that the huge potential for hydropower project. All the riparian countries are primarily interested in hydropower to minimize increased demands of electricity of domestic use, irrigation, flood um, regulation, and energy security. With such realization and the quest for a combined solution, the countries will be able to install interest into action, which is important prior to initiating any regional cooperation. The presence of cognitive community, I would like to put a more emphasis on this point. The purpose of the cognitive society is to enable states to envisage the value of solving the problem together and we lobby for the specific perception. As a significant actor, we'll forward any progressive regional developmental agenda. There are also several successful examples across the world. One is uh, Euphrates Tigris Initiative for Cooperations, which bring Iraq, Syria, and Turkey, and United States that has been emerged with an approach to promote sustainable cooperations. We can learn from the outside examples so how to build this cognitive community. National and transnational NGOs are also playing effective roles in putting pressure on policy issues up in the government and at the same time have impacts over the creation and public opinion in social issues, as Aisha pa also mentions what people want. So this cognitive community can also explore that options. They are yet to develop a 
combined voice in South Asia. Having said that, the cognitive community yet to have a combined voice here. It also creates hope to generate ideas of forming similar civil society movement in the areas of common river water sharing at the regional level. However, it is also important to consider the nature of the states in South Asia that apply despotic power to intervene into the spheres of the civil society as part of the state-led co-option process. This is also reflected in the structure of the SARC, which is state-centric in nat nature. SARC has limitations to accommodate non-state bodies as part of the multilateral cooperation framework. Um, so in addition to this, the NGOs and civil society in South Asia depend on external resources too. So despite such limitations, civil society have emerged in the South Asia as a crucial actor and a parallel force to the government in most of the South Asian countries. That gives us a hope. There is a high potential that of combined force of civil society informed experts epistemic community and the multilateral bodies can form an effective co cognitive community that aims to contribute in collecting and disseminating information among the South Asian countries. To let the people and government understand the nature of the problem and advocate for a workable solution of the crisis. Now the last point, hegemonic conditions. I know we are already talking about the asymmetric interstate relations between the South Asian countries are critical in exploring um, hegemonic conditions for potential cooperation. That discrepancies are reflected when a state's voice is projected in any policy matter and also determined by the behavioral pattern of states towards each other. And we have observed that. A positive leadership role of the countries by taking the issue-specific lead and sharing the cost of the co cooperation might be the best alternative solutions of the problem. As we have already highlighted, the Dhaka Bangladesh have initiated the, um, the and played a pivotal role for emergence of the SARC. So why not issue-specific leaderships can be taken across the South Asian countries just to just to overcome that standstillness that we are facing at this moment. More importantly, the trust and faith India can achieve through its leadership role they will help them to overcome the long-standing image crisis in the region. India's move from bilateral to multilateral cooperation has many positive implications in the region. We have seen parallel multilateral initiatives sub-regional initiatives now at this moment. So the two big questions is now, um, considering this um, stand till stillness of the SARC, is it ripe to revisit the charter of the SARC? And also the second question, some of the speakers also um, brought up that, are the other sub-regional initiatives hampering the future of SARC? Here it will be my points and instead. I think South Asian countries have already um, uh, uh, by voted to alternative regional and sub-regional organizations, whether they are successful or fail, this is another topic of a discussions. But these initiatives fit actually the India's vision, which prioritizes neighborhood first and is at East policy. Hence, the hegemonic role of India plays fostering the regional cooperation under BIMSTEC banner is the key to the organizational success. So taking this example, we can also use that that other member states in the SARC or both large and smaller powers have their own interest and needs in both organizations. Some are the more distinct while others try to read the context and act accordingly. But there may not be the optimal solutions, but technical collaboration between countries forming common interest and limited membership might lead to a cooperative environment in the, for the better for the future. Um, so BIMSTEC offering opportunities for smaller states in the region. The idea of the promoting shared prosperity is visible not only due to India's 
sheer desire to take the leading role in BIMSTEC, but also owing to its commitment to share center stage with smaller states. And, and, and this small initiative, this uh, uh, sub-regional initiatives can also be um, uh, important for breaking the ice or, or, or building the trust among the countries, among the other South Asian countries. We shall not also forget, and this will be my last point, that we shall not be forget that we are living in a reality which is completely a globalized world. States have come to appreciate that they can achieve a kind of a psychic comfort in collectivities through multiple memberships or multiple loyalties that can advance both local and global values without one distracting from other. A growing appreciation among these lines can only be explained by this above mentioned development, this sub-regional cooperation, multilateral cooperations that we are talking about. So allegiance to multiple memberships is not surprising, but rather an outcome of fragmentation's world system in which issue-specific arrangements is obvious. And integration is not impossible within it, but fragmentation is also obvious. The development of multiple groups and understanding that local, national, and transnational affiliations need not to be mutually exclusive, but can complement each other. So we have to take this initiatives as a as a as a encouraging factor. And also, I want to finish. Uh, with the hope that we should not forget that South Asian countries are facing severe challenges in the terms of, will be facing severe challenges in the food, food security. So agriculture, climate change, energy cooperations, these are the areas where they can actually put more emphasis on. And we should not forget about the social issues, the people's well-being, especially the women empowerment issues. This can be the, an, another area where the South Asian countries can learn from each other, each other share their knowledge. And also the other two aspects, three aspects, like we should not forget the South Asia region is a, shows economic promise. It has um, also rich reserve of water resources for hydroelectricity. In, and it also offers a pool of young human resources talented between the age of 15 to 24, and also the emerging South Asian diaspora, we should not have forget. These are the positive areas that we all should think about how we can utilize this and we can, we can make this force in this uh, good side into a force. And it can be play a critical role in the future of SARC. Thank you, I stop here. Marvo, thank you for your deliberation. I especially appreciate the many practical examples and possibilities that you've explained to us in the ways how we can try to revive this regional body again. And many of them are implementable. Aisha also did mention that the SARP is a concept which is mooted in people. So we must again go back to the people. And maybe try bottoms up again instead of top to bottom. So I see that South beside engaging with governments has a number of people-oriented activity. I'll just give a few. It has a South Journalist Forum. It has a South Chamber of Commerce and Industry Forum. There is South Asian Association of Regional Cooperation in Law, Association for Law Lawyers Organization. There is South Asian Federation of Accountants, there is South Asia Foundation. There is a foundation for South writers and literatures. There is also a South Asia initiative to end violence against children and South Asia Human Rights Foundation. So there are several initiatives that involves organization, civil society organizations, NGOs, which are beyond the government. For example, we are practically operating and are in the process of uh, making a network of South Asian think tanks, which would be another organization that will form part of the South people or interactivity. So people must again take the lead. And that is the way to go. And I really appreciate, Marufa, your approaches that people can take the initiative, people can take functionaries and make it work again, maybe in a bottom up approach. I would now like to acknowledge the presence of our former foreign policy advisor, Dr. Iftikar Ahmad Chaudhary, and take the benefit of hearing from him 
the formative years of Sark because he was a diplomat in the MOFA and he has personal experience on how the concept was mooted and floated by Bangladesh. Dr. Chaudhary, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, General Munir. Uh, I should be frightfully remiss, of course, if, were I not to thank uh, General Munir and uh, 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 Editor Saban for inviting me to participate. And uh, hearing so many stimulating remarks by our panelists today, uh, I'm tempted to speak. And as Oscar Wilde has famously said, the only way you can get rid of a temptation is to yield to it. So. So I will, uh, okay, uh, uh, Munir has invited me to speak to, uh, to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to the initial, uh, the beginnings of Sark, the initiation. Theoretically, uh, the central trust, it's true, of course, the background, as he had said, that uh, it was Bongabundu uh, Sheikh uh, Mujib, and on the 6th of February, 1972, uh, I haven't got the papers with me, I've just relocated from Singapore, uh, I've just got this book along, and uh, in, in this piece there is a reference to that uh, speech of uh, Bhagavandu, and who uh, uh, said that the uh, the whole of uh, South Asia uh, must cooperate, uh, otherwise history would not. This is a quote from him: "History would not forgive us." Of course, it found shape and fruition uh, during the period of General Zia. Uh, uh, as president eventually thereafter. And that is when we participated in the formation phases in the ministry under the aegis of, uh, of Ambassador Farooq Subhan, who was uh, director general. There was myself and the uh, 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 Afzalur Rahman, a colleague who now lives in New York, and some others as well. Now, um, uh, as I said, the central thrust uh, in the jargon of international relations uh, literature was new functionalism of Sark. Now, what is, uh, give me half a minute to explain what neo-functionalism is. It's the idea that uh, building cooperation across a broad spectrum of activities, uh, beginning with innocuous ones, uh, will ease tensions at central levels. So that is the theoretical basis. You come, you cooperate on smaller bits and pieces of, of of possibilities and build, which would reduce tension at at uh, at uh, more central levels. Now, uh, the uh, our inspiration then wa was, of course, uh, the the functionals. Your functionals were mostly Europeans. There was Ernest Haas, the Jean Monnet, who was uh, who headed the uh, 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 French planning, and there was David Mitrani, and uh, these. Uh, uh, new functionals were both theoreticians and also uh, pra practitioners, and uh, the European coal and steel community, which was, I think, set up in 1952, was the frame of reference initially as, as a target. I, I also uh, uh, was able to observe uh, the Pacific Forum from my perch at the uh, Australian National University in Canberra, and uh, there were some, uh, some inputs that you would obviously expect from that. Uh, initially, India and Pakistan, as you have heard, both opposed SARC. Uh, India, of course, uh, because it apprehended a clubbing together of the smaller fellows. And Pakistan, because it thought India was too big and would invariably drive the process. Hence, two principles had to be written into the charter. And uh, the, these formed what is known as uh, uh, Article 10 of the Charter. Now, the Article uh, 10 um, uh, says that uh, you, uh, SARC would not uh, discuss or take action on any bilateral or contentious issues, um, uh, uh, which pretty much, you know, uh, takes away all, all, all bilateral issues. Uh, f from from uh, from SARC, and all issues would be uh, all decisions would be taken by unanimity, uh, not necessarily consensus. Uh, you realize there is a difference between unanimity and consensus. Consensus is an agreement in spirit, but unanimity is a positive agreement on the part of all actors. So, 
the decision, uh, so cha uh, charter, uh, the charter laid down through its Article 10 that there would be no contentious or bilateral issues discussed and no decisions would be taken except by unanimity. So, you would think, and it's true, that there's a structural impediment to forward movement because uh, no contentious issues could be discussed and uh, uh, no decisions could be taken except in form of unanimity. And yet, and yet there was forward movement, and I'll come to that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, eventually. Remember that uh, those of us uh, around this table who have been in uniform, and many of you have been, would know that no plan survives the first contact with the enemy. Uh, you see, when you, uh, when you establish a contact with the other protagonist, your plan evolves, and so did Sark. Eventually, we discovered that the corridors were more important than the cha chambers. In other words, it was the meeting of the heads of government, the principal players uh, in the governments, and among, as Munir said, among the peoples, uh, which were more important than the conferences, formal conferences within the chambers of, 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 the, of the body. Now, so that is how SARC actually eventually began to evolve. Now, what about the achievements? I shall be brief, of course. Yes, there were achievements. The achievements that South Asia is an idea. The idea of South Asia was a product of SARC. Uh, I spent the last 15 years uh, in what is known as the uh, Institute of South Asian Studies in Singapore, ISAS, uh, in, in the Singapore National University. There would, be, there would have been no ISAS but for SARC. Uh, so the idea that, uh, that elements in the region, there are elements in the region that unite us, and these are sometimes deeper than those that divide. So that was basically one of the products of SARC. Before, uh, before uh, uh, SARC, formation of SARC, one looked at the region as a subcontinent, some called it uh, Indo-Pak subcontinent, some called it the Indian subcontinent, but the idea that we belong to something wider and bigger, and that we were South Asians. We couldn't be Bimstekians, I mean, uh, <laughs> we, we were South Asians. So that took root. Secondly, secondly, and this is important politically, it strengthened the concept of sovereignty in South Asia. You see, it did not dilute it at some issues. It, uh, because it is Sark who, which, which uh, uh, enthused, as if it were, the sense of sovereignty of countries like Bhutan, Maldives. Uh, this would not have uh, gathered that kind of strength uh, if it were not for the, uh, the regular meetings in Sark where uh, Bhutanese and, and, and Maldivians uh, uh, were given uh, the same status, equal status as actors, uh, state actors within the region. Now, you've heard of the problems. I mean, it's, uh, uh, it's, some say it's dead, some say it's dying, etc. But it's certainly moribund in ways. So how can there be forward movement now? Yes, uh, Munir's point that, yes, there are people's uh, bodies. There is such a thing as the idea of people's sark. I mean, it's driven by, by peoples. The idea, as I said, that the elements that unite us are deeper than those that divide. That is a factor. That would have to be the main driving force of this resurgence. The other is, the other is taking it out in some ways from, from the, uh, the Gordian knot of India-Pakistan relations. Now, uh, can we extricate Sark from, from this? Uh, experience will uh, demonstrate that it will be difficult. Yet, there are watershed occasions in history when men have aspired to look to and work towards the triumph of hope over experience. And the idea of reviving Sark has got to be as surely one such. Thank you. Dr. Chaudhary, I thank you for your comments. A good experience for all of us to understand how it was formed and how it moved. So I shall now take the privilege of opening the floor. Please ask your questions, make your comments, and
please be brief so I can accommodate as many as possible. I will start with you, sir, first. Please, I'll start with you. Yes. Thank you. Yes, it's working. Uh, so, after hearing these sessions of discussions, I think uh, I want to add some comments. Um, I think actually some issue like why SAC is there right now, people think about that because there's no further actions from SAC in the past two decades. And uh, the core issue of why it's not uh, active, I think it's money. It's not other things. Why I said so, uh, in 2004, SAC signed the MOU with ADB. Uh, because back to that time, they have realized um, there's no such uh, act actions from SAC side. They need some money to support some act uh, activities. Uh, recently, uh, you know, ADB under, under ADB, there's one program called SASIC for the South Asian sub regionals Economic Cooperation. That program is running quite well. And in 2018, the SAC uh, Secretary General, Mr. Amajet Hausain Sao, he have another meeting with refreshed interest to uh, corporations with ADB again regarding uh, how to uh, foster the partnership with ADB. Uh, so I want to go to the core issue is once they have money, they have enough money, they can, they can definitely have more activities. They can also strengthen the presence in the world. That's point one. Point two, during the discussion, we have always discussing about the uh, India's role in SAC. Um, but people don't understand the, the status of the member states is different. And also India has its own um, issue to address. We always say that with the big, um, uh, with big you can say, uh, big brothers can always carry more responsibilities. But we also have to look into the picture. I'm not, I'm not saying that uh, India should not be acting quite actively in SAC, but uh, they need to address some issues uh, at home at first to uh, present uh, more and stress more in SAC role. So that's my comments I want to add. Um, and the uh, final thing is uh, I think we can, uh, we can also strengthen their partnerships between SAC and also other MDBs, like World Bank, like ADB, even like AIIB. All this actually, they are quite uh, willing to support SAC. Um, from my understanding, because I'm in the infrastructure business, so I do understand there's so many finance facilities which is available from AIIB, from World Bank as well. They can support SAC to grow further. So that's my comments. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank okay. You. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks for inviting me. Well, I'll be very brief and I'll say a few words and more in the form of observation. I have no question as such. First of all, uh, as you said, in case of, uh, in the, in the case of Dr. Thakar Chaudhuri, uh, I also had the, had a, had a f uh, sort of privilege to be associated with a process of germination of the concept and also and like uh, two of my colleagues here, we are the same generation of foreign service officers, was involved quite um, actively in the first SARC summit. Uh, although none of us, among the three of us, became foreign affairs advisor of an interim government. And uh, so uh, I'll have, um, I'll make just a few points. First of all, I'm not a great uh, taker of the contention that it's because of India-Pakistan relations uh, that SARC process has remained stalled. It's remained stalled more in the, in the context of uh, holding summits. Of course, the summits have importance. It gives impetus to the process, to the secretariat's work. I mean, this kind of a seminar would have been more uh, uh, sort of uh, meaningful uh, with a broader-based uh, uh, participation, mostly from the mem uh, representatives of the embassies of the member countries. We have the Pakistan diplomats here, but nobody from the Indian mission. So. I don't think that it all because of India-Pakistan relations. SARC process has survived hiccups in these bilateral relations between India and Pakistan. It survived uh, Babri Mosque uh, uh, deterioration in relation. It survived Kargil. It survived uh, the Mumbai incidents. So, is why is it stalled? I mean. Can Bangladesh play a role here? I think Bangladesh has, if not a moral responsibility, some kind of an enlightened responsibility 
to try to reinitiate the process of convening the summit. Uh, in that case, uh, one problem that we have in Bangladesh is that we don't really have a bipartisan approach to foreign policy matters. I mean, is, does, do both the major parties have same kind of approach to the issue of SARC? I think that is uh, an issue here. I mean, that and that might have possibly held back a possible re-initiative by Bangladesh towards convening SARC in a meaningful way. And although there, the, I mean, I draw this from my own experience that although there are, there is a provision that in the SARC Charter that the member countries will not discuss uh, contentious issues, but I do recall here the 2004 summit in Islamabad, where at that time I was the Bangladesh High Commissioner. That summit uh, also resulted in Islamabad declaration between Pakistan and India, the famous Islamabad Accord. So the, the SARC summits do provide the opportunity, the forum, for, even for discussing uh, contentious issues. So all that is required is some kind of initiative, and possibly Bangladesh could take some initiative here. Thank you. Thank you. Lieutenant General Zaheer. I think uh, revising SARC has uh, two villains. Uh, one is a doctrine, another is an issue. <laughs> The doctrine uh, that has been enunciated on the wake of war on terror, uh, that if you are not with us or with me, you are with the enemy or them. This doctrine is still in, in play, as we see in Ukraine, and we see that same doctrine in play in, Bang in, in Southeast Asia. S sorry, South Asia. Uh, the other issue is uh, the Kashmir issue. Whenever we say Pakistan-India relation, uh, it boils down to Kashmir. And that's a stumbling block. Uh, and, and, and all others can be solved. But this issue which cannot be solved. So uh, the first one uh, um, is difficult, the doctrine. Uh, it is in vogue. It is ongoing. Uh, can, um, if states can uh, really come out of this and have the right to choose and also have the right to be neutral if this is not brought back I think uh, we're in great difficulty about Kashmir issue uh, some say it is not resolvable but I as a commander of National Defense College back in 2005 and 6 tried through uh, one mystery Ikram Saigal, who is a Pakistan strategist, he was a resource person in uh, NDC, Bangladesh, and we talked. And even this went through to President Musharraf that we suggested a moratorium, a ceasefire and moratorium on Kashmir for 15, uh, 10 to 15 years. And um, such thing has been tried, like we have seen in, in the case of Sudan and South Sudan. There was a moratorium like this, and, and although the outcome was separation, but then here the outcome could have been different. And Pakistan was in a way amenable to this idea, uh, but then uh, this did not progress. Why I'm saying this here, that rest of the country of Serb, um, including Bangladesh, should push both India and Pakistan to have a moratorium, to freeze this issue for at least 10 to 15 years and set it aside and move forward, sir. So my comments from the panelists. Thank you. Thank you, General Muni, for inviting me to this forum. Um, just a couple of brief, que uh, brief uh, comments, if I may. Um, I was involved with the 1985 SARC summit uh, a little bit, and um, I wanted to touch base on touch uh, a couple of points here. Despite all the misgivings that India and Pakistan had at the launching, it was still able to take off. The summit was able to take off, and bilateral contentious issues were discussed at the very first summit. The mechanism that was developed by Bangladesh at the time, and Dr. Iftikhar Chaudhary was there, will remember perhaps, 
uh, others were, my colleagues were there as well, uh, was to take them out for a retreat on a ship in the middle of the river so that the uh, heads of the governments could speak to each other freely and frankly without the presence of the media. And that did happen. So India and uh, Sri Lanka came to an agreement. India later on sent uh, forces to Sri Lanka, which had disastrous effect afterwards. But nevertheless, it was discussed during the retreat in the first Sark summit. The other issue that General Zahir just referred to was Kashmir. And at the first Sark summit, the each of the seven heads of state and government were about to cancel stamps on the first SARC summit. Two stamps for each country. At the very last minute, the Indians came to us, the, there was a call group, and the Indians came to us and said, we can't cancel these stamps. Why? Because Pakistan's, one of Pakistan's stamps has shown Kashmir as a whole, as a part of Pakistan. <clears throat> so for a moment, it seemed that the summit will be you know, disrupted. Everybody will go home and nothing will happen. The uh, declaration, the charter will not be signed, etc., etc. So it was a moment of great tension. Um, how do you bell the cat who, uh, to tell General Ishad that this is going to be canceled and how does the summit progress further? The, uh, the responsibility was put on Ambassador Farooq Chaudhry and Ambassador Shafi Sami because they were the chief coordinator and the coordinators of uh, the summit. And they went and in, uh, informed General Ishad. And General Ishad said, go and inform the Pakistan president, Mr. Ziaul Haq, General Ziaul Haq. So they both went there. Uh, I know because I tagged along as a part of the core group. Uh, General Zia was very magnanimous. He said, Koi baat nahi. I'll just cancel one uh, stamp and the others can do uh, the regular cancellation of the two stamps. So that happened. And the summit concluded peacefully without breaking out into a war. What was missed at the time was that these uh, stamps were being cancelled at both ends here in Dhaka by the heads of state and government and at the capitals at the same time. And happily, Pakistan cancelled its both, both its stamps because they didn't know what was happening here. So, you know, there are ways of getting over these obstacles, many, many ways. The most important issue, I think, um, the bull in the China shop is political instability in each of our countries, member countries. That is what is hindering SARC. Not the people's will, not the will of the <coughs> func uh, functionaries. It is possible to take off SARC. It is not dead. It's not going to be buried. And I have full confidence that it will be revived sooner or later. But before that, um, just to remind people that we often hear the comparison between ASEAN and SARC. If I remember correctly, ASEAN slept like a dragon for nearly 25 years. It didn't move. It did not actually start functioning until and unless Indonesia became a democratic country. With the first elections of Indonesia, the political elections of Indian, Indonesia, that's when ASEAN started moving. I was based in Indonesia at the time, and I saw the movement. And uh, it was interesting how all countries coalesced together. But remember, let us remember that all of them were by then established democracies. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, for reminding about the cruise, because uh, I, on the, star, on the staff of Gentleman Up, we were the persons who prepared the cruise, and we said sell. I was on board the cruise, so I remember how heads of states can really relax and behave without the presence of the media. And they're completely different animals at that time. <laughs> and, uh, Mr. Shamim, I, I thank you for reminding us that all the SARC member countries uh, should have been here. 
I can assure you that we invited all our colleagues from all SARC member countries. I, I, we did, and we reached out to all of them in addition to sending cards and emails. So we are thankful we have the presence of at least the Nepalese DCM. We have the presence of our diplomatic friends from Pakistan. We had the confirmation from the Maldive ambassador. Maybe she got busy somewhere. But we did reach out to the Indian High Commission a number of times. Perhaps it was not interesting for them to be present here. Also reflects their attitude towards SARC. And that's how it stands. So I will go back to you, sir. You wanted the floor? No. Mr. Zanze? Yes. Thank you very much, uh, General Sabin. First of all, let me thank you for organizing this session. And uh, I thank all the panelists for their very insightful and enlightening views. I acknowledge the presence of Dr. Iftikhar Chaudhary, Ambassador Naseem, and all our distinguished uh, panelists here uh, who have spoken before me. Uh, so first and foremost, as a founding member, Pakistan attaches immense importance to SARC, and I think uh, we, we, we acknowledge uh, the role and vision of Bangladeshi leadership in coming up with the idea of uh, SARC and for forging the efforts towards uh, South Asian regional identity. In many ways, Pakistan agrees uh, with, with the views which have been expressed uh, here that SARC's failure to make any headway can be attributed to the lack of genuine political will uh, to promote regional cooperation. And as Pakistan has consistently maintained, uh, casting shadow of bilateral problems on the regional body undermines the, not only the charter of the, of, of the organization, but also the SARC spirit, which has also been mentioned by uh, Dr. Iftikhar. Uh, on its part, Pakistan attaches uh, importance to, to regional cooperation and has made serious efforts to resolve all bilateral issues uh, in a peaceful and amicable manner, including the core issue of Kashmir, which, which has been referred to by a number of speakers before me, and which we believe is essential to uh, promoting and achieving lasting and durable peace and prosperity in the region. Now, we believe that simply condemning or discarding uh, SARC, uh, or for that matter, any regional body in any region, uh, and trying to promote exclusivist approaches to regional cooperation only amounts to addressing the symptoms without tackling the root cause. And what is the root cause? I think perhaps you've heard uh, a lot of speak, a number of speakers uh, uh, mentioning that, that it is a lack of genuine political will and sincerity of purpose to promote regional cooperation and to prioritize these objectives over bilateral contentious issues. And I think here I would uh, like to uh, refer to uh, the comments which have been made by our speaker, uh, one, of, one of our panelists, that here the quality of leadership matters a lot. And uh, I think that has also been uh, the, the incident and the anecdote which, which has been mentioned by Ambassador Nassim as well which shows that the, the quality of leadership, if, if it, it, it comes to that level, to, to set aside bilateral contentious issues to, to achieve a higher objective, I think that matters a lot. So where do we stand now? I think serious introspection is needed on the part of SARC member states. How do they wish to take forward this, this process of regional cooperation or whether they want to do that or not? Pakistan shares the disappointment uh, felt by other SARC member states over the state of affairs. However, we are not uh, pessimistic about the future, which would be tantamount to undermining and questioning the vision of the founding fathers of this, this regional body. Now, despite all, all this talk of paralysis and dysfunction, uh, we believe that new and emerging challenges confronting the region have opened up space for cooperation amongst regional countries. South Asia is home to over one-fifth of the global population. It is, uh, prog prog it is in proximity to, a, to an emerging global power, a uh, very dynamic human resource, uh, youth population, and it is one of the most vulnerable regions to climate change. And growing incidents of climate-induced disasters could lead to rising sea levels, water and food insecurity, and all, of, all these challenges which have been mentioned by a number of speakers here. So we believe that SAR can play a key role in responding to the impacts of extreme climate events, which, which are induced by climate and uh, other natural calamities. And uh, according to experts, I think the future prosperity of South Asia would depend on how well we deal with these climate challenges. So are the regional states up to this, this challenge? I think this is the question we should be asking. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I 
would also like to recall that SARC was one of the regional bodies that identified the climate change challenges and environmental co cooperation way back in 2010, way before many other countries did any, any structural cooperation on these fields. But whatever we have created so far, we have tremendous potential that we should reap out of this. So I shall go back to Ambassador Shahids, please. Thank you, General. Um, well, um, as you mentioned, uh, that uh, you were with General Munaf when the, the SARC summit was going on, and he played a very vital role. I think uh, it's good to rem remember, rem uh, to remind that he also uh, played a very important role in cementing the SARC. And uh, uh, Ambassador Nassim Firdos also talked about, uh, as we were, you know, well, well associated at that time, to go back at that period, you know, it's all the memory that fades away after some time. But I think these are all human memories uh, is a very important, not only from the archives. Uh, I'd like to thank and recognize our very distinguished, eminent uh, uh, Dr. Iftikhar Chaudhary. I think his elder brother, Farooq Chaudhary, was a very important uh, element during that SARC. And uh, as a, uh, he has passed, but we all remember his contribution as well as Safi Shami. He also played a very important, but it's a difficult time to, to hold the first SARC summit. Uh, I was uh, here as a director of program planning. Uh, I was about to, I was losing jobs. Every, I was about to be sacked every day. Something was going wrong. Well, I'll not touch on all those things. Uh, um, those, were, those are all history. But let me say, as you, are, you rightly mentioned, that there are so many bodies which are, which are quite active within the SARC. Uh, so much so, the other day, I did not attend that. But the SARC Ladies uh, Forum in Dhaka is very active. Uh, so much so that they had a uh, whole day program and it was very widely, you know, accept, uh, you know, represented by all the SARC countries. Uh, so you see, that's, that's going on. Uh, uh, to say that uh, uh, SARC uh, is dead as you open the, the, the sentence, uh, which is a little, uh, you know, concerned with question marks, of course. Uh, but I think the uh, question of reviving uh, is not the question the India and Pakistan don't see eye to eye with everything. But I would say over here that uh, in the Shanghai Forum, uh, India and Pakistan are sitting together. And many other, I mean, I can't go back, but there are many other forums where India and Pakistan, they discuss many things. And uh, as uh, Shamim and Nassim uh, mentioned, Ambassador Nassim mentioned, that uh, um, I think it's not the, 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 the differences between India and Pakistan that is uh, blocking uh, the, uh, you know, SARC. But I think Bangladesh, I remember at that time, uh, one of the foreign secretaries who is no more with he became a very important uh, finance minister. And uh, I remember, I was a junior officer, his opening remarks was that every region in the world has uh, uh, a body that represents all the countries. And the, the South Asia was missing, and today we are very proud that we have this SARC, and we have laid the foundation of the SARC. And, uh, you know, we feel very privileged, you know, being at that time very junior officers in the ministry, that the Bangladesh has contributed. So much so, I think Bangladesh has also contributed, uh, you know, uh, we were, we were, you know, nobody is going to talk about it, that's history now. Uh, but I think we were pushing for the SARC headquarters also in Dhaka. We, we, it didn't, doesn't happen. It has to go by, by, by as uh, you know, Dr. Thakar very nicely put, uh, gave the difference. We all, you know, mix up with all the words, the difference between unanimity uh, and consensus. So you see, it happened. It, it didn't work out for Bangladesh, but we have the Bimstek headquarters where, uh, you know, Dr. Thakar Chaudhary was the advisor, and that time he laid the foundation. And I happened to be very closely associated while I was uh, posted abroad with SAR, with the BIMSTEC. BIMSTEC is, 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 an, is, is a body which only can complement and uh, it can supplement, but it cannot be an alternate to SARC. SARC has its own, you know, as, you, as we all agree, to, to have its own locus standi to, monitor, to, to function. Like all of the, this, uh, Nassim very nicely mentioned, for 25 years, the, the ASEAN was, uh, was, was, nobody learned, knew about ASEAN, and people were worried how would Myanmar, how would Laos, how would many other countries become members, but they all became members of the ASEAN. And, uh, you know, so we can have the interconnectivity relationship with these bodies, but uh, SARC, you know, it has so much of, you said there are nine observers. You know, all, uh, you know, giants, uh, you know, the, the, 
uh, European Union, the, the Americas, the China, and many other countries you mentioned. So this is HARC has potential. So Bangladesh, uh, I think uh, we have the ability to move forward in this area. I would end over here. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You mentioned that about the observer countries. The nine observer countries are all the powerhouses in the world. And maybe South should find out some mechanism how uh, to activate more activities from the observers to revive the process of the South process. May I now go back to the DCM Nepalese Embassy? Thank you. Thank you for inviting the Embassy and me to this uh, beautiful event, actually. It's uh, high time we uh, spoke about this topic. And thank you for bringing up this topic. I was uh, very reluctant uh, about speaking here because most of the things were covered by the speakers and the eminent guest uh, present here. But then I had uh, memories uh, with regard to SARC, so maybe I, I could speak. And because I also represent Nepal here, maybe I, it's time I, as a civil servant of Nepal, I reaffirm the commitment of Nepal uh, with regard to reviving and revitalizing SARC. So I joined uh, Nepal's Foreign Service back in 2010, and SARC division was one of the first divisions I was affiliated with. And during that time, SARC was still a vibrant organization. The sectoral meetings were we were going quite well, the, the summits were happening. There was a short of mo momentum going on during that time. But you know the fate the SARC has, uh, the, the, uh, SARC has gone through. So, And I think still there is love, immense love and goodwill among the peoples uh, in SARC countries. And I think uh, that has uh, uh, kept the SARC intact. I, 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 w uh, I disagree that SARC is dead. Uh, because uh, it is there, and being a host nation of the SARC Secretariat, uh, I would have to say that SARC is very much there, though um, not functional, not up to the mark uh, as uh, it was, it had to be. But I think uh, uh, SARC, as, uh, SARC as an organization for Nepal is very important. We attach uh, high importance to uh, SARC. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you for your commitment. We appreciate that. We'll go back to you, sir, Ambassador. Mr. President, thank you for giving me the floor. I am not so pessimistic that SARC is dead. If you just take the history of European Union, how many years it took? First European colony still Union, then Jean Monnet gave the idea in 57, that customs union, common currency, European foreign policy. So I think we'll have to have a patience. Of course, we are upset. I was also involved along with my other colleagues in 1985, first SARC summit when SARC was born. And I agree with you, you said in your uh, opening speech that SARC has undertaken many initiatives, and I think that's from that from that so where we should take SARC up, like SARC food security, SARC energy cooperation, SARC regional connectivity, and also as recently as COVID nineteen, the, the, this provided a wonderful opportunity for SARC countries to take common initiative to tackle this COVID pandemic. And, and it is rightly so that Bangladesh can take initiative to revive SARC. It takes time. We must not be impatient, you know. And I hope that SARC would again, uh, SARC, though SARC Charter prohibits contentious issues, but it doesn't preclude other issues, other opportunities, like sub-regional initiative. And I hope Bangladesh can take some initiative to revive the SARC. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. And I would also like to remind everybody that 
there are 12 regional centers of SARC that are established throughout the SARC region and they are functional, they are operational. There are two in Bangladesh, for example. Many of you may not have heard the name. There is a SARC Agricultural Center in Dhaka. There is also a SARC Meteorological Research Center, which is located in Bangladesh. There are 10 other centers spread across the South Asian region, and many of these centers are functioning well. So there is a lot that is happening below the summit level. And those are the flickers of hope that we must rekindle. Brigadier Azaz, you have the floor next. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> sir, my question, my question and the comment is regarding reviving of sir. I agree with the Foreign Secretary, Mr. Tohit, that actually the border issues and the line of control. Sir, I had an opportunity when I was serving as a defense advisor in Islamabad. We were taken to the line of control, the border area. I was present there for two hours, and I have seen standing in the line of control on the Pakistan side, and we could see what is happening on the Indian side also. So, so the border issue, and we have also visited this United Nations Observer Mission in Islamabad, and we asked them different questions. And this mission, Observer Mission in the Islamabad regarding India-Pakistan relationship is prevailing for more than 50 years. So. Sir, this problem is a remote chance that India-Pakistan relationship on Kashmir will be, or the border issue will be resolved very soon. But the effort should be on that keeping this relationship, how much we can promote the reviving of SARC. First of all, sir, the main role has to be played by, as far as I understand, this India and Pakistan, and more focusedly the Indian should take the lead. And secondly, the leadership which has got good relationship with these two countries, good relationship, sir, who can approach, if they are allowed to approach, they can take an initiative to revive this arc from the life support or to whatever state it is there. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, just to get back to your questions here, that the South Asian University is already established in New Delhi. There is a campus that has been established, but the Indian government, I understand, has now given a larger campus area where the, a new campus is, will be built in future. The new idea that has been floated is not to have a single campus, but spread the different schools and the different campuses in all South Asian countries. And I think that is an excellent idea, and if that materializes, then it becomes more dynamic. So thank you very much. Um, I have heard the diplomats and I would like to congratulate uh, for their optimistic view. But since I come from the military background, uh, I'm a little bit pessimistic. Uh, Dr. Ithikar Chaudhary, sir, you had mentioned about uh, shark is not dead, it is moribund. Being dead is better than being moribund because dead, they never come back. Being moribund, they can, may resuscitate themselves in uh, disconcerting apparitions. I have read this book, Jay Shankar's India Way, what is the present state of Sark, and he has not contributed much uh, uh, to the Sark chapter in his book. Now, how does India, Indian Foreign Minister is Jay Shankar, and in fact, if you read his book, he is recollecting the Indian mythology, like say, for example, Krishna's choice, uh, from the ancient uh, Indian lore, uh, which says that probably the current Indian leadership looks at the continent in a different manner. This is first point. But it is extremely important that India's leadership has to be extremely effective because it is in the center and it is so powerful and we have talked about the asymmetric power. From that point of view, we must also accept Indian leadership, but what kind of leadership that India will provide to this region is important. That has to be benign. I'm just talking from, uh, uh, what do you call it, from realist point of view. And you have also talked about new functionalism, which is very important. We should overcome the, first of all, small little issues and then reach up to the bigger ones. Just take the example of Pakistan's appointment of 
the chief of army staff. Now, I was watching the Indian televisions, and there were many think tanks which came up, in fact, uh, commenting on the appointment of General Asim Munir as the next chief of army staff. I was very surprised. Indians don't even talk so much about the appointment of their own army chief. And it was very disconcerting, as if the Indians are more concerned and apprehensive of Indian army chief rather than their political issues. I mean, this is the mindset. When you are treating Pakistan army as an enemy of yours, not the state itself. So this mindset has to change. I would rather say that having so many economic uh, forum or say cultural forum, we ought to have a defense forum also in order to create a sense of respect for each other as military organizations and institutions. This is second point. Third point is that there are external actors also. China is there. The United States of America is there. They all have eyes on us. And the most important in that regard is the role what Bangladesh plays. If Bangladesh cannot come closer to Pakistan because Pakistan is an important element, this arc will not simply revive. This arc will not simply revive one of the most important, uh, what you call it, concepts uh, that promotes regional harmony is the respect for each other. And the third, th final thing I would say that it is extremely a challenging task, not only for the uh, common people, probably who are more uh, concerning towards SAR coming up as a regional body, but from historical point of view, SAR as a concept, which has been proposed by uh, Bangladesh, which was in fact Bangladesh being the founding father of SARC's concept, uh, it, it sometimes should feel to us that it is a historical anachronism also, because challenges are very high in that case. Had the region intended to remain integrated, then possibly in 1947 we would not have got disintegrated. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Rust, please. Said so I'm coming to you next. Uh, yeah, he's, he's working. So many, uh, say, complicated issues and complicated thinking. Probably our hairs are clogged by this time. Uh, Sark is dead in Anilla. Uh, but <laughs> it is not that. Just this month, I, I just go for the uh, lighter portion of the, uh, this issue. Just this month, uh, me and my wife, we visited India and uh, I went to, we went to see the uh, Red Fort. There were a few rows for the entry fees. Uh, there were counters for the locals, for the foreigners. I went to the foreigners counter and it was written 500 rupees. And for the locals, it was only 35 rupees. You see 465 rupees more for the foreigners. I presented my passport and the guy said, uh, you're from Bangladesh. Uh, so you go to the local counter. For Sark, it is 35. So who says Sark is dead? <laughs> I could say for 465 rupees and my wife also 465, you just add it up. 14.28% more for the foreigners. So, and now uh, there are so many ambassadors here. I give one of my personal ex uh, say, uh, experience, experience as a reporter. In 2005, I was a diplomatic correspondent of a highly circulated news daily. And that time, uh, Sark was scheduled to be held here. My uncle-in-law, Mr. Anurul Alam, he was there in the foreign ministry. Probably he was the second senior most after Mr. Shamsher Mavin Choudhury. But I never used to go to his office or ask for any sort of information because of some intricacies. I want to avoid that. So when the Sark summit was uh, scheduled, that time uh, Mr. Moshed Khan, who was the foreign minister, he held some for a press conference. And uh, probably before two or three days, uh, he told us and other person, the Mr. Shamsun Mobin, that yes, everything is settled. I just uh, we just talked to the Indian Foreign Secretary, and it is and nothing to be worried. Okay, fine. I went back to my office and made the report accordingly. And uh, probably at eight at night, my uh, advisor uh, editor, who was uh, a very renowned uh, say journalist and once a uh, minister also, he was a veteran politician also. He called me at his office and showed some report of Indian news daily, The Hindu. It came in the internet as a online uh, say part, a very small portion. 
that uh, the India might not join the SARC summit. Some sources say this is this, 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 blah, blah, blah. I said, so what? It's just a little bit report. And he said, my advisory editor said, no, there are some kitchen cabinet and something behind the door. And the Hindu, this newspaper, they represent that inner circle, the South Block. Just write a report that such summit is not going to help. I said, what, what the hell? But I had to comply with and uh, I wrote the report accordingly. Next day it was seven column lead, I think. And uh, from the morning, everybody started jumping on us. There were so many phone calls from the foreign ministry, from the intelligence agencies, from this and that. Even my uncle-in-law, he called me, what the hell have you done? This is going to happen. Have you gone mad? So I got somehow puzzled. I went to the press club. And I was and all my colleagues, they bounced on me, said, what have you done, Mr. Roos? And so, okay, fine, let, let's wait and see. And we were watching TV at the lounge. Probably at 12 or 12.30, there was a scroll, breaking news, Sark summit is cancelled. I, I, oh, I, 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 I just uh, made myself comfortable that my report turned to be true. <laughs> so uh, what Aishapa was, why I narrated this, Aishapa was telling that some quarter uh, they don't want uh, that Sark should go ahead, uh, say, peacefully or say, in a right way. Yes, there are some some quarter beneath the carpet, which we do not know. But another thing is that there are non-state actors. Uh, during 2016 SAC summit, uh, which was held in Islamabad, so far I can recollect, the India didn't participate. They blamed that the, there was Uri attack, the terror attack, and India said that the Uri, they blamed Pakistan. And before that, they blamed Pakistan for uh, Mumbai attack also in 2008. And Pakistan also blames India for their involvement, alleged involvement for the uh, Baloch Liberation Army or the insurgents in Balochistan. So these are the non-state actors. I think uh, we should consider this thing also. Okay, we are coming closer to the closure, so please be very, very brief. We'll have two questions. The second last question is from Zayed, and then the last question, we'll go back to our friends, young friends, or students from the university. You would have the last question before we go back to the panelists for their comments. Zayed, please. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, just a very quick sort of uh, comments and questions together. Uh, I, I hope I was, uh, I'm Dr. Zahid Khan, I'm a reader of politics and international relations. So just a couple of contradictions that I see here, uh, which seems to be addressed and also uh, to be raised, the right questions needs to be raised. First, we do have a country which says uh, neighborhood first is their, is their foreign policy. It doesn't sit well when you have a neighborhood first policy and then Sark is dead. So then we need to start investigating what does neighborhood first means and what is its ultimate objective. That is the first thing that needs to be. Second, I think uh, the audience and particularly the Excellence Ambassador has very poignantly uh, pointed out that Sark has survived many such controversies. But then the question then, the right question uh, as a PhD researcher, uh, I always focus on what is the right question. That the right question is, what has changed since 2014? And that is a manageable question that we should ask. And, and then the subsection of that question would be, what has changed internally and externally? And just to, to give a few pointers on that line is, internally we see a political system which feeds on to pro or against India or Pakistan. That narrative prevailed and that has dominated. So you always have a pro or against Pakistan lobbying or narrative to survive in a political landscape. It is not as much as about the money. So the cognitive, uh, which uh, some of the uh, panelists have uh, rightly pointed out, has been I know, I know uh, corrupt would be a very strong word, but has been molded into that sort of narrative. Externally, if you see, India is looking outside. It is chairing the G20 uh, 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 group, SCO presidency, 
Afro Asian meeting will happen next year. So, what is the incentive for India to look inward, to have SARC alive? So, these are the questions that needs to be uh, probably uh, more uh, accurately asked within the time frame of what has changed. That would probably make it more uh, uh, arriving at more particularly uh, uh, realistic solutions. And I'll, I'll end with one example and one realistic example. What happens, how the South Asian countries will, for example, respond if there is a large oil spill in the Bay of Bengal? There is no alternative for the South Asian countries to come to in some sort of compact, global compact, to address the issue of attribution and also compensation from the perpetrator who has done that. Because the waves do not know uh, the geographic boundary, it will ha affect all the South Asian countries if that kind of uh, uh, natural disaster happen. So the, the, the talks are OK, and we can always romanticize about what has happened in the past. But we need to be focused on what has changed particularly. And do we continue to contribute in subscribing to the change, which, which takes this uh, SARC to remain dead forever? Thank you. Thank you. The last question from one of our friends from the university. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'm Musaddeq Ahmed from East West University. Initially, SARC was established to perform regional cooperation, but now we can see SARC is no longer suitable for regional development and cooperation. Uh, Dr. Marfa, ma'am, discussed about the objective of SARC. Uh, my question to Marfa Akhtar, ma'am, uh, as a student, I just want to know, uh, what are the effective steps taken by the members of SARC uh, in recent past to achieve the objection of SARC? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, very much. I do not intend to take the floor, but I, I think um, Rostab has uh, mentioned an issue which I believe I, I had to respond. Uh, let me reiterate uh, Pakistan's uh, position on, on some of the issues. Uh, Pakistan, like I mentioned, has always been forthcoming in discussing all bilateral issues, including the issue of Kashmir, which we believe remains the core issue between the two largest countries in the region. And not only in, in a bilateral setting, but also multilateral. And it goes without saying that Kashmir remains uh, today one of the longest standing uh, issue on the agenda of the Security Council, with 11 Security Council resolutions which call for the uh, resolution of this, this this conflict in line with the aspirations of the people of Jammu and Kashmir. So uh, let me reiterate, Pakistan has always been uh, forthcoming and uh, 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 has not shied away from, from dialogue on any issue. So this, this is just a brief comment. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you also for your extremely uh, pertinent and very valuable comments and questions. We shall now go back to our panelists for their final comments and replies. So, Tohit, I can start with you. Oh, anyway, thank you. Um, just to say, uh, just to uh, share a little bit of optimism that has uh, been expressed by most of the commentators and, uh, and the panelists also. Um, uh, my presentation was largely pessimistic, uh, I know. But uh, the optimism is that the people actually want much more connectivity, much more uh, togetherness than uh, maybe our political bosses are allowing us to. Um, who doesn't want to travel uh, without any hindrance within this region? If I am sure that all Indians, all Pakistanis, all Bangladeshis would, would like to have that. But our politicians won't allow that because they have their own agenda. Uh, for their own survival, for their own benefits. But I think that uh, Bangladesh can certainly start an initiative to research itself. Um, I, would, uh, I would say that the, when India, uh, because of some reasons, refused to go um, for the Pakistan uh, summit, summit in Pakistan, um, very quickly, we supported the Indian position. I don't think it was necessary because even one abstention, as per the charter, says that the summit will not take place. So we could have stayed uh, silent. I, I think that would have been more prudent. But unfortunately, we uh, jumped into the bandwagon uh, very quickly. This was not necessary. I think Bangladesh should take an initiative 
along with uh, other smaller countries and uh, try to revive these arc activities. It's good that some of the activities are going on despite the fact that there is no uh, summit. Um, I think I'll uh, just make that comment and stop here. Thank you. Asha? Um, I just want to a brief comment. Uh, Ambassador Nassim was saying how comfortable you are without the media around. Well, the media is here. And so I want to make a bit of an uncomfortable comment. And uh, the media get people into trouble, they get themselves into trouble. So let me get myself into trouble. We're uh, speaking about uh, the underlying feeling we had is about uh, India resisting a revival of SARC. But what about us? Let us be introspective. And uh, someone around the table might have mentioned about, you know, being leaning towards India or leaning towards Pakistan. But other than that, in our internal politics, uh, every time there's a change of government, there's a change of uh, policy or change of mindset. So someone else mentioned about the importance of leadership. So when we speak about SARC, uh, I'm glad that uh, you had mentioned about uh, even before Zia Rahman, perhaps Bongabon, they had a sort of vision, a South Asian vision, and you mentioned how it was uh, President Zia who was, you know, the founder of the vision of SARC. So what happens, the problem with SARC within our country is that when we say SARC, we tend to always see it as a brainchild of President Zia, which is true, but then when a different government comes in power, they don't want to accept it. And so then SARC has got some sort of negativity towards them. So if we could promote this idea that it's also, you know, it's a sort of, it's an idea that is generated from Bangladesh so that no government who comes will try to negate it or take it, you know, okay, we don't, everyone should have an ownership. Everyone should be the owner of SARC. They shouldn't feel that, oh, it was not our idea, so it's not ours. It's a brainchild of Bangladesh. Thank you. Marufa? Um, I think I will also again uh, reiterate these three, um, uh, three points that already Tohit Sar and Aisha uh, mentioned. Along with this, I would still talk about one uh, um, respected part, uh, participants also raised the money issues and also say that talking about the South Asian universities revival and which actually I was pointing out when I mentioned cognitive society, I mentioned also the donor agencies, the think tank, the universities, the civil society, they, they should play a big role. If they come together and raise a voice and become a voice of the people and then also try to convince the state States. Maybe at one point states will find out the, the mutual benefits, which is um, more larger than the contentious um, uh, national interest. Of course, national interest in the international relations is the most important, become more important at this moment. But still, I want to be very pessimistic when we look at the climate change problems, which is more larger than even um, uh, bilateral issues. When you look at the food security, we do have a food bank. Um, SAR, under the SARC, there's a food bank, which is not operating. Maybe this is the time when the whole world is going to face the food uh, insecurity, could be a pivotal uh, to revive the SARC again. Um, and there is a question, um, one of the students raised the question, I think today we all spoke about what the achievement, there are a lot of achievement. Murali Jamasar also talked about nine centers, multiple conventions, um, and also, um, as I mentioned, food bank, agriculture, nutrition, conventions, there were conventions on disaster management, coastal zone ma management, so there are a lot of development happening. So what the point we are just talking about today, that those are not effectively working. So maybe this is the time to talk about this functionalist approach and then um, for reviving um, and the leadership. De definitely in every negotiations, even if you look into the uh, international climate change, the Paris Agreement, why it was successful because of the diplomatic efforts during uh, during the conventions, during the meeting. So I think we, we need to cultivate more on how to become uh, successful and uh, bypass those contentious issues and bring all the leaders put together at the same table. Thank you. Uh, let me now 
go to the final segment and important segment. I go and hand over the microphone to my co-host, Mr. Zafar Sovan, for his final comments. Uh, thank you, General, and thank you all of you who have uh, taken the time to be with us uh, today. I think there's been a lot of consensus, if not unanimity, around this table when we discuss the fact that while SARC has become moribund and largely non-functional, that neither is it dead nor can it be allowed to die. And I think that is a platform uh, upon which uh, we can uh, we can move forward from. And I think specifically it's been mentioned around this uh, table that Bangladesh has a, 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 a very strong role to play here as the progenitor of SARC and also as one of the, the major economies in the major countries of SARC that our interest in um, SARC functioning is a regional entity, is a, uh, is a community is extremely strong. And we've mentioned before, you know, to talk of the elephant in the room, that, you know, the, the fundamental problem SARC has faced in terms of its um, functionality is the hostility between India and Pakistan. But this is something which, you know, isn't really or ought not really to be much of an issue with Bangladesh. Bangladesh enjoys cordial and good relations with both these countries as we enjoy cordial and good relations with all of our other uh, SARC neighbors. And so, the fact that there may be uh, hostility between India and Pakistan shouldn't necessarily be something that uh, that, that stands in Bangladesh's way as a country for um, reaching out uh, to forge connections and seek advantages uh, regionally and within the community. Um, I think it's very important what a number of the speakers have mentioned is that we shouldn't look at SARC and think of it as being something which has achieved nothing. It has been uh, stated and uh, demonstrated by many of the speakers here that SARC has many achievements to its credit. Right from its inception, I think General Munir was the first person who pointed it out, that uh, when you talk about issues of climate change and the environment, in fact, SARC was ahead of the game. It was, you know, this is now, you know, uh, the, sort of the hot button issue in terms of, uh, in, in terms of the world. But, you know, uh, a decade ago, Sark was ahead of the game talking about how we needed to address issues such as these uh, from a regional and not a national perspective. And we've also learned about a lot of uh, uh, 12 regional Sark centers in work which is, uh, which is happening. You mentioned um, um, agriculture, you've mentioned food security, sort of under the surface. And so I think that also gives us hope that uh, uh, Sark can continue to operate. And I think one point which many of the speakers, not just the panelists have made, but the speakers here as well, is that at a person-to-person -person level, there's a great deal of interest. So we may have problems state to state, but I think it's important to look at the issue of SARC from a person-to-person -person perspective. And I think the um, desire for closer ties, the desire for closer cooperation certainly exists in every country, including India and Pakistan, um, when it comes, uh, to, if we look at how does the citizenry of these, uh, of these countries uh, feel about the, uh, about the issue. And I think in conclusion, there are just a couple of points. One is we do also have to look at um, the issue of internal politics, and I think this has been uh, a point made by a number of the speakers. Right now, when we talk about SARC being moribund, and then you talk about, uh, you contrast it to earlier, happier periods um, um, in terms of cooperation, 80s, 90s, 2000s. What has changed? And this is a question which was brought up. What has changed is internal politics inside countries. And, you know, and of course, internal politics matter. You know, SARC is going to be a political football uh, in Bangladesh. It's a political football. Uh, this is, as Aisha mentioned, it's also a political football, of course, in India and Pakistan and in every country. This is the way of politics. This is uh, the way of the world. But politics change. Interests change. Alignments change. Things grow. Things evolve. 
and the fact that at this particular moment in time or in the last decade the internal politics of various countries were such that it seemed as though uh, it made it very challenging for sark to move forward and be effective does not mean that in the future in the coming years and decades that that will be the case uh, the um example of asean was bought is a regional entity which was very unpromising and very moribund for some some decades and is now moving forward and uh uh you know with with great effectiveness so that also can be an example for us and a reason not to um lose hope i love the um uh uh ambassador chaudhry had mentioned neo functionalism and i think that could be um a real uh intelligent way for us to move forward in really starting to um get sark to become more functional look at the small things the little things where we can work together and maybe you know uh, we put the big issues on the back burner understanding that they may be too contentious they may be too controversial but slowly slowly we address smaller issues build confidence and then before you know it actually a platform has been created to a platform has been created to solve even larger issues in in conclusion i think we've also talked about other um regional uh agglomerations such as beamstick but we all agree while beamstick is important it can at best be a complementary force to sar it cannot replace sark and i think there's a couple of reasons for this but the fundamental reason and this is something we've talked about is that south asia does exist is a cognitive community it does exist is an idea we all understand what south asia means we all understand why there's a divide between south asia and southeast asia i don't think there is any um i don't think there is any uh argument or controversy about the idea that south asia does exist is is an entity is an, is a place and for that reason alone if not for the other reasons that's why we have to continue to develop south asia in south asian cooperation and finally when we talk about why we need this regional cooperation it's simply because in the year 2022 and this has always been the case but as uh, as the world becomes more interconnected as our problems and challenges become more interconnected so many of the challenges we face so many of the problems we face is nations is people can only be solved at a regional level if we at, at a regional level if we talk about issues of security if we talk about issues of water if we talk about issues of climate change if we talk about our place in the world um uh, with respect to um geopolitical um challenges and geopolitical tensions it is imperative that we address all of these issues together is a region in fact it is not possible for us to address them in any other way and for all of these reasons i think sark will continue to live and while it may be on life support i for one am hopeful and confident that we will be able to revive and resuscitate it and as i said and and if i could conclude we need to revive and resuscitate it because there really is no alternative thank you Zafar I thank you for your very pertinent concluding remarks and comments I thank you ladies and gentlemen for being with us for the last 2 hours to talk on an issue which is extremely important but has not been talked much in Bangladesh or in other capitals but we really want to bring the topic back to the table because it is important for south asia it is important for people of south asia and it's important for regional stability and international stability please join me in thanking our esteemed panelists today for their extremely valuable comments and remarks and here we conclude and invite you to join us for a cup of coffee outside thank you